good evening everyone and welcome along here to Bullaroo to listen to tonight's Bible address. We're going to be having a look at some prophecy tonight and tonight's topic, a Russian invasion of Israel is inevitable. For those who, who are with us online, welcome and I hope you enjoy the evening as much as us here. It's a, an amazing topic, Bible prophecy. And it leads us to look at many different things. And so tonight, the future of Israel is on the line, is what we want to have a look at. So uh, we're going to look at that topic. To open, we'll ask you to please stand while we open with a word of prayer. Great God in heaven above, we come before you at this time to thank you for all the wonderful things that you do. We thank you for caring and protecting and being with us and we thank you for allowing us this opportunity to open your word, to consider your message, to consider the prophecies that you have left for us to work our ways through and understand and learn what you are doing with Israel and with the world and with us. And we pray you'll be with us this evening, be with our speaker and be with all those that are learning of your ways. We thank you for this opportunity and we ask this prayer through Jesus' name. Amen. So to introduce tonight's topic, we're going to take a Bible reading from Ezekiel chapter 38. The Old Testament prophet Ezekiel, he covers lots of different topics in his, uh, in his book of prophecy. And when we get through to Ezekiel, uh, the, this section of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 37 talks about how the children of Israel are going to come back to their own land and to their own place. And then after that, we find Ezekiel 38. And this is what we read in Ezekiel chapter 38. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man... Set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the, chi the prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Goma and all its troops, the house of Togoma from the far north and all its troops, many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and your companies that are gathered about you and be a guard for them. After many days, you will be visited. In the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which were long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations and now all of them dwell safely. You will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. Thus says the Lord God, On that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind, and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. Sheba, Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all the, their young lions will say to you, Have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to, to take great plunder? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, 
Thus saith the Lord God, On that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many people with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come up against my people, Israel, like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, Are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? And it will come to pass at the same time when Gog comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, are all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountain shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many, on the many people who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. It's a dramatic prophecy there in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 38, and uh, it leads us to a good base for us to have a look at tonight's topic with our brother John, who we're looking at the topic, a Russian invasion of Israel is inevitable. Thanks for that, John. And uh, good evening, one and all, both here in the hall and online. A Russian invasion of Israel is inevitable. Inevitable simply means it's going to happen. We're going to be looking at the Bible. We're going to be looking at uh, um, some of the events that are happening in the world and have been happening for the last few years. And uh, to put it all together, to try and show conclusively to anyone looking on that there truly is an, a Russian invasion of Israel inevitable. But the, the, what we're going to be pointing forward to is not just so much that it's going to happen, but what do we do to make sure that we're okay when it happens? And that's where we're going to be leading to. And we start off with this uh, verse here. It's in the book of um, the prophet Amos, and he wrote some 700 or so years before the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says this, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophet, prophets. And so God is going to reveal what he's going to do. Now, it doesn't mean every little detail he's going to give us, but he's going to give us a picture, enough to know that God is alive, God is well, and God is working in order for us to be able to make a decision that we want to try and either try to get on board with him for those who are prepared to watch and listen. All right, so... We've just had a look at the, uh, the words of the prophet Ezekiel. And we're going to go now to verse 2 to start off with. He says, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now the word Gog simply means, remember in the originals, in the Hebrew, and the Gog, Gog simply means a leader or one at the top. Now what we've got now is some names that are given here. We've got Magog, we've got the Chief Prince, we've got Meshach and Tubal. Now what we're going to do is have a look at what the, the names, where the names of these territories, actually as we're going to show, actually are today. Now to get an idea how, how it's working we, and the fact that it was an, uh, uh, the name of a territory, say 700 years before Christ or 600 years before Christ, 
to get a handle of how it's working is simply as we look at the, the dirt that we live in here. We live in Australia. And if we were to pick up a, a map and it'll have Australia written on it. If we were to pick up that same map 300 years ago, it won't have Australia. More than likely it's going to have the name New Holland. So if we picked up a, a map, say in the 1600s, late 1600s, early 1700s, it would be New Holland. But if we picked up that map and had a look at it, and we looked at some writing that someone might have said about the, the dirt that's called New Holland, we would know it's talking about Australia when we looked at it today. And that's what we're going to see um, is happening uh, in the Bible, and we can take that from the Bible. Now we're going to just uh, put forward what some of these names mean, and, uh, and then we're going to be able to see the territories it's talking about. Um, Mago, we'd see today, is equivalent to Central Europe, and we'll have a look at how we get that in a minute. Chief Prince is actually better understood as the Prince of Rosh. Today we'd see that as the area of Russia. Mishek is the area of Moscow, the current capital of Russia. And Tubal is Tobolsky, which is the current area called Siberia. So if you're not a good person or not seen to be a good person by the Russians, you end up in Siberia cold place. Now, pardon me, this is just looking at Prince of Ross, because I, I'm using the authorised version or the new, the, um, the King James version. Other versions will have a difference. They'll have, like here, uh, the Prince of Ross. But if you have a look, this is an interlinear Bible. And you, they, it's got the Hebrew, and underneath it it's got the English. Now, the, the Hebrew goes from right to left. We normally go left to right. But if we have a look here, this little bit here, it says the, this is the English of the Hebrew. The land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. So we just saw that, but it was called chief prince in the King James Version, which I had on the screen. So we just have a look at the end. There's a revised version. And look, there's a number of, number of different versions which, which we could relate to. And it says here, Gog of the land of Mago, the prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal. So again, see this chief prince in the authorised version, or King James, is rendered prince of Rosh. Now we've said it, we're claiming it's Russia, so how do we get that? Now we're going to have this little part at the top, says Rosh, or Ross, or Rus, is the ancient name for Russia. Now, if we're to look at the Encyclopedia Britannica, and depending on which version you get to, it says Russia is derived from the Rossia, derived through Rossia from the Slavonic Rus or Ross. If we go then to Jesenius, who's a, what's called a lexiconographer, which means they, they actually study words and they put it down like a dictionary, and it's in the Old Testament, uh, which has the, the Hebrew Old Testament of the Bibles written in Hebrew, basically. And he says this, he says, Rosh, it's a proper noun of a northern nation, undoubtedly the Russians. Now, we could go to a number of other, other, other references as well. Angus Bible Dictionary, undoubtedly the Russians. And there are other uh, references around. All right, so we've now got uh, Russia as Rosh. We see in decline, Gibbons, decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And he says... Among the Greeks, the national appellation for the Russians had a singular Ross, which come from we get the Ross or the Rosh. And so we time and time again we're seeing this confirmed for us. Now if we go to Mago, now we claim that Mago was that area of Central Europe. It says Mago, this is Josephus. Now Josephus was a historian who wrote about forty to fifty years after the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified and ascended into heaven, uh, raised and ascended into heaven. Mago founded those that from him were named Magogites, but who by the Greeks are called Scythians. Now we've got to do a little bit of a trail here, haven't we? We're looking at this. The Magogites are called Scythians. God wants us to do a little bit of homework to find it out. We've got a man by the name of Herodotus, and he says the Scythians 
found in Central Asia. They were found from the Danube to the Don. And we'll have a look at that area in a minute. From the Danube to the Don, Central Asia, he says. We've got a man with the name Sicilus. He says, by BC 100, they had spread to the shores of the Baltic. All right, let's put it on a map and see if we can make any more sense. Herodotus takes these two areas here. See the area from, from the Danube, as that little blue line came in, to the Don, as, the, as on the other side. Now, when we got the Sicilus, and he actually puts them as being up the top here around the Baltic area. And so what we've got now is this area here of Central Europe, including Germany, um, is this area of Magog. Some, some commentators will actually have include this little area to the Rhine, and the Rhone is there somewhere too, uh, and which again includes Germany. So we're looking that, that, that Magog is that area of Central Europe. We come to the other ones. Meshech and Tubal gave their names to the two tribes, Moschi and Tabar Tabarini, Tibarini, and areas Moscovy and the River Tubal, which later give rise to Moscow and Tobolsky. So this is Meshech and Tubal. Now if we just have a look again, we put them on the map. There's Magog. There's Rosh. Gog of the land of Magog, Prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal. There's Meshech, which is Moscow. And then we've got Tobolsky, or Tobolsk, which is over here, taking its name from the river Tobol. And so putting now again, shortly, we, we've got those all together now. Um, we come now to Ezekiel 38 and verse 4, because God's now saying what he's going to do with those, what's going to happen with those people, you know, of Central Europe, of Russia, of Moscow, Tobolsky, and that, that area. He says, I'll turn thee back and I'll put hooks into thy jaws and I'll bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armour, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. And so God's going to now bring this army down. He's gonna, we're going to see where he's going to bring it. But he's going to turn them back and they're going to come with an army as they come forth with all their army or that uh, area. Now, a writer back in 2017, four years ago, actually examined what was called a manifesto outlining Russia's plans um, about what they were going to do on the world scene. And there were two people who got together. Their names were... I'll get it in a second. I'll come this way. Their names were Alexander Dugan and Nikolai... Lockatops. And what they did is they, they sat down and they put together a paper which was basically the projection of what Russia was going to do over the 20 years from when they wrote. It was 1997 they wrote. But what, the, what it was going to do is ha it's telling how Russia would exert itself on the world scene. Now this, this um, author of this article, it goes on to say in this last line or two, he says, chillingly, the book now reads like a to-do list for Putin's behaviour on the world stage. Now, Putin's this man here, as we see. He's the president of uh, Russia today, Vladimir Putin. But he's saying what he's doing is reading like he's just going out of the, what has been laid down as a script for him to do. Now, he, he deals with a number of countries, and particularly we'll see some that will affect what we're talking about tonight. Now, the Ukraine. He talks about the Ukraine. Ukraine is a, com a country which was part of Russia back in, in the early, in the 1980s. 1990, things fell apart for Russia and the, the Commonwealth of Independent States was formed. Um, and Ukraine moved away to be independent. But God said he's going to turn him back. God, God gave in, and the Russia gave independence to all these, all these countries. And an article which about 10 or 15 years ago was showed to me, and it basically said this, that this man, Mr Vladimir Putin, said all that Russia has given back, they're about to start taking back. They're going to turn back, and God's going to turn them back to the ways where they were, where world domination was what they really were, were after. And so Ukraine comes up in this little manifesto. And it says here that the text goes on into a very specific list of to-dos about Russia's posture towards almost every nation on earth 
the book argues that Ukraine should be annexed by Russia. Now, it's just so interesting, it says that Ukraine should be annexed by Russia. It's, we'll have a look and see where it is geographically in a little while. But it's just underneath Russia. It was a part of Russia. It was the breadbasket of Russia. But no, no longer is it there. But they're saying, yes, it should be a part of Russia. Crimea was a part of Ukraine. Crimea, the area of the Crimea, it was annexed by Russia in 2014. And we're going to see that it's a real sour point between Russia and, and the Western powers. And so they've got that back in 2014. And they're saying that the Ukraine should be there too. 100,000 troops were moved to the Ukraine border, um, Russian troops, to let them know that they want Ukraine to come back to the fold, one way or another. OK, we've got Turkey, Kurds, Armenia. Russia identifies Iran as a key ally, which is interesting, we'll see that in a minute, for Russia, and recommends that Turkey should receive a series of geopolitical shock, shocks and the Kurd, using the Kurds and Armenians to keep it off balance. And so Russia now is working in this area here, all around here, to bring them back. Georgia has had some geopolitical shocks up here, this little area is called Nagorno-Karabakh, Nagorno Karabakh. And there was a little war in there just inside 12 months ago, seven or eight months ago, 10 months ago. And this area of Azerbaijan attacked in here. Armenia has been the area which has supported this one. Russia and Armenia were generally allied. What happened then is in this war, eventually Russia stepped in and got peace between them. But Russia left 2,000 troops to just hold the fort. And so effectively, the area of Armenia and this, this area here is now being almost swallowed up by um, Russia, which is exactly what they plan to do. Their, their plans are on the move. And see here, here we've got Armenia. Here's what's called Crimea, just under here. And here's Ukraine in this area, just here. So we can see, and Russia just above it, yeah? See those areas there. All right, so they go on. Even Australia gets a mention. Australia, China, Philippines and Indonesia. We'll see, see the importance of it. When basically what it's saying is that they, they're promoting the fact that China... This is Russia now. Promoting the fact that China should be encouraged to have its posture, geopolitical posture, aligned to the south. In other words, to move down into the South China Sea to look at the Philippines and Indonesia and Australia. Why? Because there is one, and we see that happen before our face. It's happening now, isn't it? There's, at the moment, we've got British ships you know, in the um, South China Sea ready now to try and support America. And, and, there is, and it's really on in that area, as we know. It's uh, very tense. But the reason Russia wants it, it says here, right in the last line, so that Russia can remain predominant on the Eurasian mainland in Europe. They want to now focus on Europe, on China to say, take, divide the attention um, of any powers to stop them from uh, moving towards um, Europe. With Germany and France, it says it also talks about making Germany and France the predominant powers in the European Union in order to unbalance that alliance and encourage an anti-Atlantic sentiment on the continent. And we'll see that that's all happening. We see it's all happening before our face at the moment. We see things like this. Russia's entrance into the Catholic Europe while Britain exits. And here now we have here the Chancellor of Germany. And we have here the President of, of France. And they're both now inviting Mr Putin of Russia, the, the President of Russia, to join them. That they might come together, one with another. That they might be all part one uh, part and parcel together. We've got here Ru Russian President uh, Vladimir Putin with French President um, Macron. Yeah? And so, and so the, the buddies are now moving together. Vladimir Putin with Chancellor of Germany, Russia and Germany coming together. We see those things happening before our face. Now part of this uh, um, manifesto they put forward is they want to see Russia return as a superpower. They want them back as a superpower. And it says that, like Putin, that these two people saw the collapse of the Soviet Union, which happened in 1990, as humiliating. 
They've now therefore sought revenge in kind that Russia would return to what they consider its rightful place as a superpower. So there's now, we're seeing things that are on the scenes that are happening in the world about us, all supporting the fact that we're going to see the scripture. Now Ezekiel 38, 15 goes on to identify Russia, not, not by name here, but by location, by ge geographical position. And in verse 15 it says, And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. So in the word uh, here for north parts has got the idea of the uttermost parts of the north. In other words, it's not going to just be north parts. And the uttermost parts of the north is taking it from the land of Israel. The prophet was a, an Israelite and he was writing in res with perspective from Israel. And so if we go to the uttermost parts of the north, we see Russia. In actual fact, almost, almost in a direct line north of Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, is Moscow, the capital of Russia. And he goes on to say in verse 16, And thou, that's Russia, with the other ones with him, shall come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, you leader, before their eyes, um, a company and a mighty army. And so that's what is going to happen. And we see here, don't we, that with the introduction now of what we're saying of where Russia's going to eventually end up, there might go a few other spots around, but they'll end up in the mountains of Israel. Against my people Israel, he says, I'll bring thee against my land. That's where he's going to head. And in verse 8, we see, as we go back, as we go back before, we come back now to seeing the fact that he's going to definitely invade the land of Israel. Verse 8 says, and it gives us a lot of information, verse 8, we'll see. It says, After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. We've got a lot of information given to us here in this one verse. It tells us it's got to be after many days. The prophet wrote, wrote this uh, prophecy about 600 BC. So it's going to be a long time after that. We're now down about 2,600 years later. But it says there, it says, Thou shalt be visited in the, the latter years. Well, the latter years can be a, a description of a time, it's a description of a time period. But when? Latter years, depending on the context. Um, it uh, can be a time periods before, which were latter time periods was finished. But the context is telling us it's going to be our days, our time, the last days before, before as, at the end of time as we know it for this uh, civilization and constitution. It's the latter years, thou shalt come into the land that's brought back from the sword. Now we saw the identification of Israel earlier. Here we get it again. It's the land that's brought back from the sword. Israel was was taken to the sword in 70 to 135 AD when the Romans just destroyed the place and, and, and cast the Jews to all corners of the earth. And it says, they, but they're going to be brought back. And then he says, against the mountains of Israel. There's no doubt, is there? Where is he going to come? He's coming against the mountains of Israel. And it says, they've been always waste and they're brought forth out of the nations. Now then we... We start to see it coming together, don't we? There's a battle coming up. The Bible describes it as the Battle of Armageddon. The time period is when Israel possesses the land. And you know, this could not have been a hundred years ago. It couldn't have been a thousand years ago. It couldn't have been the time of the prophets. Because Israel wasn't actually possessing the land as they do today. Location, the land of Israel. I shouldn't say the time of the prophets because they, they were back in the land, weren't they? But most certainly couldn't have been 500 years ago. The location is the land of Israel. That's where they're going to come down. That's where the final battle's going to be. 
And we go for, we're going to slip back just a little bit into the previous chapter in Ezekiel. We start to see a bit more information about the return of the nation of Israel and how God's in control of this all. And when we see that what he's done with the land of, or the nation of Israel, we see that his hand is at work and we can have confidence that the things which haven't already happened will happen. So in Ezekiel 37 verse 12 he says, Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I'll open your graves and I'll cause you to come up out of your graves and I'll bring you into the land of Israel. So they obviously weren't in the land of Israel when, when the time the prophet is speaking about. They've been in dispersion, but they're going to be brought back. And so in World War II saw six million Jews go through the Holocaust, were murdered, ruthlessly murdered by, by the Nazi regime under Adolf Hitler. And so the world felt guilty as people of, the, of Jewish origin were trying to now get back to what was called Palestine in that day. And they got on boats and they came from all different directions to try to get to this land, which was a dirty dust bowl basically, but they wanted to get back there. And in, on the 29th of November, 1947, the United Nations sat down to cast a vote on, on whether this land, which was called Palestine, should be partitioned. And there were 33 voted for the partitioning of the land that Jews might have a part of that land. The bluish section there was to be given to the, to the Jews. The other part was for the Palestinians. And so, on the, like we said, 29th of November 1947, they sat down, they voted, and they cast the votes, and 33 voted yes. There was uh, 14 said no, and there were 10, 13 said no, sorry, and there were 10 abstentions. On the basis of that, there was then, a, it was then decided to partition that land, and it was effective, going to be effective eventually uh, in May. And so from that point onwards, the Arabs poured across the border, and the Arabs outnumbered the Jews in the land extremely highly numbered, outnumbered with the Jews. And, and the Arabs vowed they're going to push the Jews into the sea. Well, it didn't happen. And on the 14th of May, 1948, Israel is declared a nation. As the words of Almighty God were starting to really take, take root, they were starting to really be, be founded in seeing things happening on the world scene. On the 14th of May, 1948, they were a nation back in the earth. And Ezekiel 37 verse 21 goes on to say, And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'll take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and I'll gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And in verse 22 it says, And I'll make of them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. And so what we see, God's saying that these things are going to happen. And so we see in the 14th of May, 1948, Israel's declared a nation. They become one nation in the land. In 1967, it was the um, 7th of June, 1967, Israel possesses the mountains of Israel and they took back Jerusalem for the first time in 1900 years. Those things are happening. They've happened before our face. In, when I say before our face, uh, in the last uh, uh, 50 or so years, or 100 years or so. In our time period, there's one part still waiting, and it's waiting for the King, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be set up there. All right, now, we're going to see that there's a hand that's going to be involved with Russia in, this, in giving them credibility on the world scene. And it's the Pope, or the Vatican, the Catholic Church. And what it, there's an article was written some years ago, and it said, um, before we do, there was a war then it's still going on, nearly finished a war in Syria. It started around about 2016. Been going for five years. And there, were, there was this group called ISIS, and they were going around and they were killing Christians in, in the area of Syria. And the Pope basically wanted to now get the world to come down on ISIS and stop the killing of the Christians. But he had a problem. I'll just read these little bits here. It says, the Pope constitute continues to make influential noises at the United Nations about ISIS. He is still without an army, hard power, and therefore unable to effectively deal with the problem of Christian persecution in ISIS-held territories. And so it's saying basically this, 
the Pope wants to now get things done, but he hasn't got an army. He hasn't got a gun that he can actually use to enforce what he wants to do. He used to. Hundreds of years ago, he used to have the power, but it's gone. He hasn't got it now. So he has to rely on others. And so then the article goes on to say, enter the Russian military machine. And that's really what happened. That now, the, now what's going to happen, we're going to see that Mr. Mr. Putin and the Pope are going to get together. And the Pope is saying things like this. Pope Francis wants to ask Russian President Vladimir Putin for help. And he goes on to say, according to the Pope, Pope Francis, Putin is the only one with whom the Catholic Church can unite to defend Christians in the East. And so what happens now is we're seeing now that the, the Catholic Church is going to unite with Russia. And so Vladimir Putin is now being asked by the Pope to go into Syria to defend the Christians down there in order to stop them being persecuted by this, the, these rebels which have been um, um, set up there to oppose the government in Syria. And he now goes to his, to his elite, he goes to his soldiers, goes to his military commanders... And he says it's, in mor it's morally incumbent upon Russia. Now just listen to these words. It's morally incumbent upon Russia to change this terrible status quo in the Middle East. Poor, poor thing happening out of Mr Putin. Prepare for Operation Salvation. And that's what he called it, Operation Salvation. And with God Almighty, God Almighty's aid, we shall cleanse Syria from Obama's ruthless terrorists. So he now has got... The world on his side, when he put his army, when he put his air force, when he put his navy down into Syria and makes his move, he's got the blessing of the Pope, which includes the blessing of one billion Catholics to do it. All right, now the Bible gives us another reason why, or a reason why, um, Russia is going to come down into the Middle East and not the Middle East, he's going to come against Israel. In Ezekiel 38 verse 12 it says, He comes to take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. So he comes for cash. He comes because there is money involved. There's wealth involved. And what's happened is that in recent years, Israel has discovered that they've got gas and bundles of gas and oil as well. But the gas is really the thing that's starting to really hit the, the headlines. It says gas-rich Israel sets its sight on its biggest ever offshore bid round. And what we got then is you can see articles like this. Israeli pipeline company signs a deal to bring UAE oil to Europe. Now it's the United Arab Emirates. The, as we see the Ab Arabs and the Jews are start, and Israel are starting to become uh, friendly towards each other with normal negotiations. Well what's the problem with that? The problem for Russia is simply this that it supplies gas and oil to Europe. And so what happens now is that this pipeline is going to come across, it's going to go to to the edge of Israel and shoot off towards Europe, and uh, which is going to be direct competition for Russia. Here's a, an article. It was probably almost 12 months ago now, but look what it says. It says, put in, put in Russia in its place. Israel's pipeline will foil Moscow. Now, the word Putin is obviously taken, taken a bit of a shot at, at Putin, um, who's the, the president of Russia. But yeah, putting them in their place, and it goes on to say, Israeli natural gas pipeline to Europe is set to break the Kremlin's stranglehold on energy. Stranglehold on energy. See, the Ukraine actually says Russian gas supply curbs um, to Europe a blackmail. That Russia has got a stranglehold on Europe because of the gas it supplies to them, and there's something particular in the in the in the pipeline, so to speak, at the moment. And it's called Nord Stream 2. And, and Russia has got this project, which is at st this stage has cost about $15 billion. And they're very, very much um, interested in, in the outcome of it because it's almost completed. They say it's got about 100 k's left of pipeline 
the go, 10% of the overall job. And the, and the pipeline goes from Russia through what's called the Barents Sea and comes in at Germany. There's a lot of fuss on at the moment. And uh, President Trump actually went to great odds to try and get Germany to go back on it, but they never, never went back on it. But what, what it means now is that they've got this, this great project underway. Now, if we were to look to and have a map which goes down further, right down underneath, there's another one. It's called Nord Stream, which goes through Turkey. They've also got other pipelines that go through Ukraine. Now, th these are major projects and major sources of income. Now, if, Russia, if Israel starts coming onto this scene, as it says in that article, it's going to be a problem for them. So if Russia needs to come to take a spoil, they might get the cash and stop Israel uh, being a competitor, as they are most certainly are going to be. So, in verse 5, Ezekiel, and 6, we're told that they're going to be some company, countries with Russia. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Goma and all his bands, the house of Tagama, of the North Quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. Or again, some of them are in modern language today, and we know the countries haven't changed name, but some of them are most certainly in, in uh, ancient sort of names. And so if we put it together today, we've got Persia, which is today Iran. And in actual fact, even you know, Persia, probably about 70 years, 80 years ago, if you bought a map um, of the world, you know, Iran would be called Persia. I remember accidentally bought an old map, thinking it was great, and then realised you know, some of the places didn't make sense today. But that was one of them. It was called Persia. So Persia's Iran, Ethiopia's Ethiopia, and, and really it uh, identifies with the area of Sudan today. Libya equals Libya, Goma equals France, and Tagama equals Turkey, and particularly the area around Armenia. All right, so Iran is now mentioned as the first one there. If we look at uh, Iran, um, coming, uh, it says now, this is uh, coming out of Iran, what they've been saying over the years, it says Iran should deepen its strategic ties with Russia. They feel they need to deepen their strategic ties with Russia so that in the event of an extensive war, Russia will defend Iran from American threats. So they want, Iran's been wanting this. But what are they going to do? They're going to now pay Russia compensation, annual profits of $50 billion a year. It's like, um, like uh, Russia becomes like a security guard over them. They become, it's protection money in order that they might be protected from the Americans. R Iran's also saying that they're going to give access to warm water ports. It says if America attacks Iran, Russia will be able to defend Iran, allowing Russia access to the Persian Gulf and control of its ports. And that has happened. Uh, it seems to be that now Iran is in the pocket of Russia. And in verse 13, it talks about those who are going to be with, against uh, Russia, but with Israel. And of course, Sheba and Dedan, Dedan uh, the ter, tar, sorry, the merchants of Tarshish and all the young lions. We would see it today, it's the Arabian countries, uh, Britain, and uh, those who came out of Britain, the Commonwealth countries, including America. And some might say America may or may not be there. But most certainly when you look at it, Brexit caused uh, uh, England to go towards the Young Line or the Commonwealth countries and Europe to go towards Russia. Headlines like this came out as Brexit was now be, had now become a reality, as the United States uh, could become an associate member of the Commonwealth. And it goes on to say that the reason would be to promote mutually advantageous links, reliable friends around the world on everything from business to defence. And so we see those things happening. We see that there's uh, a close time, it's mili this is the headline, with close military encounters on opposite sides of the world, Russia sending a message to the West. And so the England sent some ships and they're on their way to uh, the South China Sea. And they came into this area here, which, which is the Black Sea. And they really didn't need to, but they did. And they went around there, they went right close to the, to the Black Sea and they ended up in Georgia. And in their time of going, the Russians actually took some pot shots at them. They, they give them some warnings. There was a bomb, bomb 
um, shot at them from a plane, and there were there were actually some of the boats actually shot at them, and the the British sort of played it down and said, well, it's, they were just having training games, um, training, and but the Russians have said, do it again. You're too close to our waters. They went too close to the Crimea. They went within 20 k's up there because they're saying no, that's part of Ukraine, not Russia. But Russia said, you do that again and you're going to be responsible for your soldiers, your naval personnel being injured because they're not going to miss next time. They won't hit, they'll go to hit. Now, whether it's talk, we don't know, but it's most certainly very aggressive talk. Those ships ended up in the, in, uh, the uh, South China Sea. Now, why I, I put the link between America and England there as the merchants of Tarshish, etc., is because when the British ship went up there, it was overseen by an American plane, which was now watching to see what had happened, to keep an eye on things. Now what's happened is the British are now in the, the, uh, looking towards uh, trying to give America support for, uh, in, uh, against China. And so it says that Britain will permanently deploy two warships in the Asian waters after aircraft carrier visits in September. And so the things are on the move. Now, the Bible then tells us then there are going to be those with Israel, Saudi Arabia, Britain, and the young lions, um, America and the Commonwealth nations, including Australia. But there are going to be those who are against it. And it's going to be Russia, Europe, Moscow, um, Tobolsky, as we saw, Iran, Ethiopia, Libya, France and Turkey and Armenia. All those things are happening right now before our face. Then God says that basically, basically it, it indicates that Russia will brush aside those who are with Israel and he will then move on and then God will then judge uh, bring judgments against uh, Russia and in verse 19 he says for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel we're talking about a massive earthquake and he goes on to verse 20 and says so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. We'll have a look at this one a little bit later. Now, if we were to go to the book of Daniel, chapter 11, verse 40, we get the same, it's the same time period. See it there, it says, at the time of the end shall, shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen, with many ships. He shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Now, in the time that Daniel was talking about, initially, as the time period went through uh, from the times of the Greeks under Alexander the Great, a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes was this king of the north, and he stationed himself up in Syria and made many attacks on Egypt, and he would come through Israel to do it, and they would cause devastation when they'd come through and go back. Now that position is taken up by uh, sorry, we say the king of the north is the foreign power controlling Syria, because the Greeks controlled Syria. That position now is taken up by the Russians. Vladimir Putin is the king of the north in that sense. Now whether he moves off the scene personally we don't know. But here's the things that are written about him. Putin is the new king of Syria. It's the foreign power in Syria. And it now, he's now the one calling the shots. Is Putin the new king of the Middle East? How Russia, Russia's Putin became the go-to man. He's calling the shots in that land. He's the one who now controls it. And so we see then now that, that, that eventually they're going to overflow and come down into the glorious land. It says in verse 41, He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. The glorious land we see is Israel. And so what we see now is Russia has moved into, into Syria. It's got here, Russia expands military facilities in, in Syria. A Russian naval ship in Tartus, Syria. It's a port that has been set up as a Russian port in Syria. And they've got their biggest naval ship at sea. They're, they're now moving to increase their, their power. And this is one here, it talks about a Russian high man air base. Where is it? It's a Latakia, Syria. So they've got a naval base, they've got an air base and there they are in that area there. There's Israel just here. Only a, a spit between uh, them is uh, Lebanon. 
it comes right down here. Actually, Syria will border on Israel up here. So in Damascus being about 60 k's from the border. They're very, very close. We have reports like this. Is Russia in favour of Israel? Well, they talk it. But Russia is moving to curtail Israeli strikes in Syria. Only, only recently, in the United Nations Security Council, when, when Israel has been attacked by the Palestinians and thousands of rockets are coming over, and when Israel um, defended themselves, Russia actually put a, tried to put a veto on Israel being able to do anything to defend themselves, and they were unsuccessful. Here's now about their power. With cutting-edge hypersonic weapons, Russia leads a new arms race leads it. In verse 43 it says, he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Now the Libyans and Ethiopians are mentioned in Ezekiel 38 verse 5 as being with Russia. We saw it, didn't we? Persia, Ethiopia and Libya with them. All of them with shield and helmet. And we see what's happening now. Libya, this area here. This man here uh, um, actual fact, Khalifa Haftar. He's actually got this area up around this side where all the oil is. Russia has, is starting to put a port up here. Russia is actually defending him with troops and with uh, military advisors. As we see, those all coming together. Heading here, Russian navy expanding presence in the Mediterranean Sea and Africa. We see down the bottom. It says first in Syria, where it has a base, and the the king coming close to a deal on establishing a naval logistics facility in Sudan, which is the Bible, Ethiopia. It's on the move and it's before our face at the moment. All these things are happening. And in verse 45 it says, He shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. And we've got a little note there that the glorious holy mountain is Jerusalem. And it goes on in uh, chapter 12 verse 1 at this same time when he's now he's now in that land he's taken Jerusalem as it, as it seems and it says at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which stands for the children of the thy people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time and at that time thy people shall be delivered everyone that was, shall be found written in the book now Michael actually means who is like God and the one who's like God is the Lord Jesus Christ. As we saw, there's going to be an earthquake and God's going to intervene in Ezekiel 38. In Daniel 12, we see he's going to intervene again with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we would start to look at the same time period in Joel, Joel chapter 3, Joel wrote probably about 600 years before Christ. He said, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. The, the valley of Jehoshaphat has been described by some as being the, the Kidron Valley at the east of, of um, Jerusalem. And so it's right at the doors. He's now in Jerusalem, in the glorious land. And it goes on to say... In verse 9, he says, Proclaim you this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. And so that time comes when they come into the land of Israel. But Almighty God moves, as he says, as said in the other ones. It says, The Lord shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord shall be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Yes, Russia will come down into Israel. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. But God's going to be overshadowing it all. Zechariah 14 says, I'll gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken and the houses rifled and the women ravished. And half the city shall go forth into captivity and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And so the nations now come against Jerusalem. Daniel 11.41 says he's going to come into the glorious land. Ezekiel 38.9, as we had read tonight, thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a, a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. He's going to come with his armies. He's going to come with his 
is Navy coming from Tartus. He's going to come with his air forces and they're going to come round into the land of Israel. But then it says in Zechariah 14, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And Israel seems to be totally decimated. They've got no way out. But God steps into the battle through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, and his feet, that's the, the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. There's going to be a massive, massive earthquake. And when we look at the terrain of the world, these things are called tectonic plates, these black lines. They're where the major plates of, of earth come together, major fault lines. Right here is a, one that goes right through the Mount of Olives, which is described as it's going to, to go to the north and to the south. And it, you see it goes around. All of these plates are all joined. When it goes, the whole terrain at the moment, it said that it will move 400 metres. We, we got here the... The Dead Sea, this is the Dead Sea, it's 400 metres below sea level. It's actually described in the Bible as to become a living sea. For that to happen, the land must move 400 metres. We had 12, a 12 metre move some years ago and 300,000 people lost their lives. This is 400 metres. And tidal waves will be going everywhere. And verse 9 of Zechariah 14 says, After the earthquake and after God now takes, starts to take control... He says, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. There shall be one Lord, and his name one. And in verse 16, it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. The society we have at the moment will be gone. It will be replaced by the society set up by the Lord Jesus Christ described in the Bible as the kingdom of God on earth. Now these things are happening. A Russian invasion of Israel is inevitable. But there's a way that we can escape God's judgments. Almighty God has invited each and every one of us, as he says through the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Mark, chapter 16, verse 15, as the Lord speaks to his disciples, it says, He said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptised shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned or condemned. Now he talks, the word gospel is just is an idea, the word of the, the original Greek is good news. Teach the good news, that which is good. But there has to be a specific good news. You can't believe what we like. God has determined that if a person comes to him on his basis, on his ways, then he will accept them and he will give them life. And uh, in Acts chapter 8, verse 12, it says, The gospel is the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if a person accepts that, things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and on accepting that, they are then baptised, then they can enter into life eternal, and the judgments that are coming on this world will not affect them. Ladies and gentlemen, the time for reflection, the time for action is now. Those things are happening and very shortly it's all going to come to pass. Thanks John. Thank you for that uh, rundown of some Bible prophecy. Indeed, it's an exciting opportunity for us to look at world events and consider how they are filling in the picture of the prophecy left for us to understand. There is uh, literature that we have put together in relation to Bible prophecies, 
uh, out in the foyer. If you'd like one of those, please uh, help yourself. Or if there's something else on this topic you would like to see, please contact us and we will uh, provide you what we can and help you in your understanding. Thank you for your attendance and thank you for logging on and listening. If you would like to ask any questions, please do so uh, either after tonight or get back in touch with us as you can. Next Sunday evening, the topic we will be looking at is how we got our Bible. It's a interesting thing. It just turns up, as it were, at the moment. You can go to a library and get one, or you can go to a bookstore and buy one. But we're uh, looking at the history of how we got our Bible and, uh, and how it's all put together. So uh, a good topic for us to consider next Sunday, uh, starting here like we did at 6pm tonight. We'd like to conclude with a word of prayer. It would all please stand. Great God in heaven above, we come before you at this time to thank you for detailing to us the future of this world in words of prophecy. Thank you for letting us look forward to those things that are shortly coming to pass here on this earth. We pray that we'll be ready and waiting and watching. We pray that those people who are learning of your ways will also be standing with us waiting and watching the return of your son. We pray you'll be with us as we go from this place. We pray you will be with those who are learning of your ways. Be with us and we thank you for all the blessings and provisions you do provide us with. And until we meet again, we pray you'll be with each one of us. We ask this prayer thanking you for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.